Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm going to greet you from Johannesburg. My name is Nahama Brody. I'm the head of the Wits Justice Project, and I work at the Wits Center for Journalism in Johannesburg. Uh, sunny, but a bit cold today, and wonderful to see everyone saying hello from the messages on the side. We've got um, Zambia, Botswana, Eswatini, Kenya. We've got people joining us from Ethiopia, from Pakistan, uh, and people from all over South Africa. Um, this is going to be a fantastic afternoon. I hope we're all going to learn a lot. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, my background is as a journalist, but for the last 10 years, I've uh, focused on researching violence, particularly fatal violence, and been learning a lot more about forensic science and its applications, particularly in criminal investigations. This afternoon, we have really the good fortune as journalists, as communicators, as students, as people who participate in society to learn more about particularly applications of forensic DNA in the context of uh, not only criminal investigations, but also humanitarian efforts and conflict on the African continent. And we have experts from a number of different countries who are going to teach us a little bit about their different practices and explain how forensic DNA is applied and used in different contexts and different situations. I'll introduce you to some of the panelists in a moment, um, just to explain how this training workshop will, is going to work is we're going to start off with some small introductory sessions from some of our expert panelists, and they're going to explain some basic concepts and principles of not only forensic science, but particularly forensic DNA to us. Um, we're going to take some questions shortly after that. Um, some people have already submitted questions in advance, which we're very grateful for, and uh, that'll be our first session. Um, and after our, our questions, we're going to move into a second session where we're going to speak to an additional panel of experts and talk about the applications of forensic DNA and forensic science in different contexts in Africa. Um, for any of these uh, sessions, if you have questions, you're welcome to post them in the chat on the side. Or if you could, use the Q&A box that comes with Zoom. If you can post your questions there, we'll all be able to see it. And then some of the experts will also be able to write back an answer to you directly. We won't be taking direct questions, but you're welcome to post them on the chat or post them in the Q&A session. We're going to be running until uh, 3 o'clock Central African time. So you're going to be with us for the next two hours. We are also recording this session. So please be aware that we're recording um, when you post your comments. And obviously, just asking everybody to be respectful and thoughtful, um, mindful of other people, and considerate in terms of your language and your interactions on this forum. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing Dr. Vanessa Lynch, who's going to be our first expert speaker. So Dr. Lynch plays two roles here. First of all, she is a, a key opinion leader in the field of forensic DNA. She has a, a background in law and ethics. Um, and she is a, really a leader, a thought leader, and, and has been driving the adoption of legislation to administer South Africa's national DNA database, which would be the first of its kind on the African continent. Um, she's the regional director for DNA for Africa. She's a senior government affairs consultant at GTHGA, and she has extensive experience leading national policy initiatives and working with governments to advance dynamic legislative and policy changes in terms of the use of forensic DNA. Um, she founded the DNA project in 2005, and in 2021, she launched DNA for Africa, which is dedicated to the use uh, of advocacy, outreach, and forensic expertise to aid the development of DNA databases and casework programs throughout Africa. Vanessa is also the driving force behind the symposium that's going to be taking place in Cape Town next week. And this is really important. The reason why we have access to all these experts today is because of the symposium that's taking place next week. And I want to let all of our, my media colleagues know that some of these experts will be available for um, more in-depth interviews if you want to and uh, at the time of the symposium. And I'm going to post an email address if you want to try and uh, set up an interview with somebody, but the email address will be media at dnaforafrica.com, and you can request an interview with one of the expert panelists today or some of the experts that are appearing at the DNA Symposium next week. And I think it's the first time South Africa will be hosting um, the, the DNA Symposium. Vanessa will tell us a little bit more about it now. Um, Vanessa, if I can ask you to just talk a little bit more about the symposium, and then 
if you can maybe introduce us to what forensic DNA is and what, what it means and why it's important that we should know more about this. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, Nahama. So great to be here. And for those of you who know me, you know how I just get so excited when I see the connections all over Africa through the chats. And um, thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, I've just put together um, a few slides because it might be easier. Can you see that? Um, I'm sure you can. Um, yep, we yeah. got it. Great. So um, just because of the interest of time, um, I just wanted to quickly just go over what the symposium is all about. And it's very important at this point to um, introduce our event partners, ICRC and the UNODC. And the great thing about having these two different partners is that ICRC are very much around humanitarian efforts and the UNODC very much around criminal justice efforts. And that's why the theme of justice, science and humanity intersecting is so important with regards to this. We look at forensic DNA uh, with respect to how they intersect in terms of justice, science, and humanity sectors. So what does this mean? And, and I, I hope that through the slide, you can get a, a better idea of, of why we pull together um, different practitioners, um, some of which are on the panel today, is that forensic science, specifically with regards to forensic DNA, it talks about identification. We really are talking about identification and why identification is so important in these various fields. And as you can see from the screen, we often think forensic DNA, CSI, criminal justice, crime, but actually there are so many different elements, specifically in Africa, where we see forensic DNA can really be used to identify people, for instance, who've been trafficked and had their identity, identity taken away. With climate change and migration, so many people are found human remains, and there's no way of linking them back to the region that they're from. So missing persons, terrorist incidents, migration, criminal justice, you can see all these different um, aspects. And in between the two, in terms of humanitarian forensics, which is largely around the humanitarian and ethical actions of forensic DNA and the criminal justice sector, we have ethics. We have to ensure that we have a survivor-centered approach. At the end of the day, whilst even in criminal justice sectors, trying to identify the perpetrator, we really do focus and we must never lose sight of the survivor in respect of the story. And that's why it's so great when DNA for Africa work with the UNODC and ICRC is that they have a survivor-centered approach, a compassion towards those who have truly been affected by the adversities that they find themselves in. So, sorry, I'm going to put there. What do we hope to achieve through this event? Well, through these integrated and innovative approaches, and you'll see we have different thematic areas when you look at our, pro our program, we're trying to not only learn from each other with regards to the best practices, but also try and see the advances with regards to forensic DNA that can be applied with respect to these different um, areas that I've just spoken about, um, where we use forensic DNA for identification, identification purposes. And it's not only unique to the legal and scientific and technological um, challenges, but, but what I really love about bringing together experts within Africa is that scientists and experts work in such under-resourced environments with so little capacity, yet the casework that they're exposed to makes them some of the world's leading experts. They have the experience that no other country necessarily has with regards to what they have to work, um, work with. And given that they have such low resources, what we're trying to highlight within these events is to showcase to the rest of the world that Africa really is a resource of experience and expertise. And we need to step into this platform and this environment and, and really show the rest of the world the great work that we're doing here. Um, and this is why this, this event is, um, is so exciting because it gives these scientists and these humanitarian workers um, and change makers the opportunity to do just that. So 
obviously the objectives is that the audience will learn from these transferable DNA focused initiatives that has a survivor centered approach, but also an opportunity to engage with these thought leaders. And obviously in this panel, you'll see some of them too um, in this important arena. It's a very interactive session, um, just like this media workshop will be. And we can then learn from each other. It's not um, presenters standing up and saying, I know everything. It's about presenters engaging with each other and also learning from each other, as well as from the experts that are within the audience. And just as an example as why forensic DNA matters, and I know that some of the panelists will really go into what forensic DNA means, DNA 101, which is a very important aspect. I just wanted to give you a, um, an example of when we don't have forensic DNA capacity in a country, or if we don't develop our DNA policy, in this case scenario, a person could be arrested, no DNA is taken, they serve time for common assault, and they're released on the parole. If, however, you do have a forensic DNA policy in place and somebody is arrested, convicted, DNA is taken either at the stage of arrestee or as an offender, if you have a DNA database in place, which a, lot, a number of countries in Africa don't yet have, and a search has taken place and a match is found to an unknown crime scene profile, we often have a scenario where we can link that to up to 30 cases. What you're talking about here, what I'm talking about here actually happens in South Africa because we have a DNA database so often. The case of um, McKee, for instance, a common assault arrested, DNA profile on the database linked to 30 unsolved rapes. We see in cases now up to 50 and 60 unsolved rapes um, when a known profile is entered onto the database. And this just shows you that the limitations in terms of DNA policies in Africa need to be addressed so that we can ensure that serial offenders are in fact identified. Same with a missing person is that without a DNA database, we often have a case where an unclaimed body, and we have so many um, unclaimed bodies, unfortunately, in, in, within Africa, can be changed if we have a database and a policy that allows us to search against known and other profiles. So I'm going to hand over back to um, Nahama now because it's just to really give you an opportunity to see where we're going with the event. And I'm sure that my panelists will be able to really give a deep dive into the different forms of DNA and the way in which it's been used. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vanessa, um, and such a great introduction, touching on so many of the important points in terms of kind of forensic processes, but also DNA. And I was actually just reading on ProPublica recently in the States, again, a number of cold cases where DNA profiles were only available much later on, and retrospectively, it was discovered that sexual offense um, uh, offenders had in fact been linked to a number of other crimes and if they had in fact been connected with those crimes at the time of their initial arrest could have prevented future crimes so it could play a really really important role in that and as Vanessa also mentioned it's not only criminal investigations it's about identifying people missing people unidentified bodies um, I spent quite a little bit of time in Johannesburg working with my university's team in forensic sciences on their program for unidentified human decedents and we do know that there are families all over the continent who are still waiting to find out about where their loved ones are. So it can play so many different important roles. We've had a question from the audience about recording and will this be shared later? Just to confirm, we, will we are recording this and we'll share the recording um, once it's finalized with all of the people who registered to attend. We're going to move right along and Vanessa's actually given us sort of an extra minute, I think, that I'm going to allocate to our next speaker because he is incredibly important, um, Professor Bruce uh, Bedoli. Um, Bruce is an e expert forensic scientist. Um, he has a pedigree that I'm going to take some time to read just so that we understand who we have the privilege of listening to. Um, Bruce has published more than 700 articles. He's made more than 800 presentations. He's testified in well over 300 criminal cases in the areas of molecular biology, population genetics, statistics, quality assurance, forensic biology. He's authored and co-authored books on molecular biology, um, electrophoresis, protein detection, forensic genetics, microbial forensics. He's recently retired as the director of the Center for Human Identification. Um, uh, at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth in Texas, where his efforts focused on human forensic identification, 
microbial forensics, and emerging infectious disease with a substantial emphasis on uh, in genomics in next generation sequencing. That must have been quite interesting over the last few years, I would imagine. Um, in addition, he is currently um, the visiting professor in the Department of Forensic Medicine at the University of Helsinki, and also an adjunct professor in forensic sci at the Forensic Science Institute at Radford University. So we're really happy to have you here with us this afternoon. And I'm hoping that this will be a, a lot more fun for most of the journalists than science class was at school. But there is quite a lot of sort of science and chemistry and biology that's required to understand some of the basic principles of human DNA and forensic DNA. So I'm hoping, Bruce, that you'll be able to give us a, a primer and introduce us to some of what you think are the most important concepts around human genetics and forensic DNA. And I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you, Lakama. Um, you give me the hardest task of all to try to educate people on what takes us as scientists years to learn and do it in five or six minutes, but I'll see what I can do. So genetics is uh, used in forensics primarily as a means to establish the identity in such situations as criminal cases, who may be the source of a sample, in paternity testing, who may be the father of a, of a particular child, inheritance matters, mass disasters, who is this person of these human remains, and in, um, in things associated may not be exactly with identity is what may have been the cause or manner of death. To accomplish this identity testing that it is necessary as the predominant task of forensic scientists is uh, we rely on many approaches that could be fingerprints, odontology, um, personal effects, whatever. But DNA is one of the um, primary approaches that we use and obviously the subject of today. DNA is considered a genetic blueprint of an individual. It is, in other words, it is the, the recipe for what makes you you. And in most cells of your body, uh, you have the same, I guess, okay, blueprint in every single cell so that it carries that information and it tells you how to make the, the molecules that allow you to carry on the functions in life. There is another DNA that we're going to talk about in a while called mitochondrial DNA it is also found in the cell that's very critical to life because it allows for cellular respiration and generating energy for the cells. If we think of the English language, it is composed of 26 letters. And those 26 letters make up the, the, all the words that are necessary for us to communicate. The DNA, which is a molecule, is composed of only four letters. But those four letters, and in its various combinations, represent and make the words of DNA. Those four letters are known as A, G, C, and T, which actually represent the chemicals of this molecule that's found in all the cells. But we're just going to focus on the four letters. They make up all the words to give you the dictionary of life that is necessary in, or in Encyclopedia of Life. In the DNA in each cell, there is, it is actually 3 billion letters long. So these four letters, A, G, C, and T, are in multiple numbers and combinations throughout that DNA to give us and tell us what we are. We get half of our DNA from our mother and half from our father. So actually, we don't have 3 billion letters in the cell. We have 6 billion because we got one set of 3 billion from the mother and one set of 3 billion from the father. And, and that is what we use to make the complement of DNA known as the genome that is found in each cell. There are differences in some of the positions in these genome among individuals. These differences, we may we call them polymorphisms, poly for many morphisms for form, some different forms. A very simple example of how this might uh, portray is thinking of the blood groups type A, B, and O, where some people are type A, some people are type O, and some are type AB, and some are type B. These are different types. Though those blood group markers, which predate the in forensics use of DNA, were used for, for many decades for identity testing, but were very limited. For example, the type O pop, people in the population of type O carry about, you know, about 55% of the people in the population carry type O. 
when we looked at DNA, we have far more information because obviously everybody we look at is different. So we can exploit that for forensic identity purposes. At the DNA level, 99.9% .9 of the DNA amongst us is the same. Every one of us shares 99.9%. .9 so only a small portion, 0.1% of those letters are, are different. And 0.1% may not seem like a lot, but if you think of 0.1% over 3 billion letters, that's over 3 million places in our DNA code that can differ. Thus, there's such a potential difference amongst individuals. And if you think of the 3, billion in different, 3 million in different combinations, there are more combinations that can be had than there ever been people on the earth and probably ever will exist. So it's quite powerful for individualizing individuals based on their DNA code. Much of the DNA that exists in the cells is actually packaged into uh, bodies called chromosomes. So there are 46 chromosomes in a cell and our DNA parsed out across those chromosomes. So one chromosome may carry the DNA for eye color, another chromosome may carry for blood group, another may come for pigmentation or height and so on. Um, if there's 46 chromosomes, remember I said there's two sets. So there's actually 23 chromosomes to a set. So we inherit one set of chromosomes from mother, one the father, as I said. Most of the chromosomes carry a lot of information, but two are very special, are known as the sex chromosomes, and they are designated X and Y. Females have two X chromosomes, and males have an X and a Y chromosome. So those are used to distinguish the biological sex of an individual. As we proceed onward, there are, we will exploit the DNA at these different variant sites by looking at markers that we target that have variation. And we will generate DNA profiles through a process, you know, a methodological process, and then compare the profiles, either what we call directly or indirectly. Directly what I mean is I'm going to generate a profile, and maybe it's not very much different than any other forensic analysis. fingerprint at the crime scene with the individual. And if they're the same, they could have come from the same source, but if they're different, they could not. So that's a direct one-to-one -one comparison. With DNA, we would do the same thing. We'll generate a pattern from the DNA markers and their, their variants or polymorphisms from the evidence and compare it to that of from a reference sample of an individual directly. And if they are the same, they could have been a contributor. And we'll tell you how likely that is. If they are different, then they could not be a contributor to the evidence, and we make a value in them. The second way we'll hear more about from other speakers is an indirect method where we look at the DNA from a relative, such as a parent, to that of an offspring, and, and look to see what they share in common. If a mother gives half of her DNA to her, her child, then that child has half of her DNA in common. So we look for part sharing of, the, of DNA markers with the parent, and that can be extended to further relationships as grandparents, siblings, half-siblings, first, second, third cousins, and so on. The real value of DNA is that it can be found in any biological material. I mentioned at the beginning that there are other types of identity testing, such as fingerprints, um, odontology, and others. You need a specific target area, such as fingerprints being the fingers, to exist. Many of the remains that we deal with in, say, a mass disaster and others, there's no flesh or left on the body. So we're left with only the bones or the teeth or the hair and so forth. The DNA is in every cell in the body. So those materials contain DNA. So it is the one identity testing tool that allows us to look at any kind of remains. And so it's far, very far and pow powerful. We're going to send the DNA to the laboratory and the laboratory is going to analyze it and look at a series of or different groups of genetic markers. One of them is known as STRs or short tandem repeats. And they are the workhorse of the forensic arena because they have many different forms at a particular marker. These different forms, you'll hear the word allele. We think of eye color as a gene. 
the different alleles would be blue eye, blue brown eye, green eye, and so on. With STRs, they have many alleles at each marker that make them very powerful for discriminating amongst individuals for determining source and, or attribution. Another set of markers we're going to hear from called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then there's also the mitochondrial DNA, and then we specialize on Y STRs as well. The mitochondrial DNA, it, well, I'll start with the STRs are very powerful, and, and they're the ones that can give us these, you know, exceptional numbers of billions and trillions or quadrillions of the, the likelihood of a source of a sample versus other kinds of markers that are less powerful. Mitochondria are, are very useful because they're the one marker that gives us the highest success rate, especially with challenge sample. Because unlike having two copies of DNA, the one from the mother and one from the father, mitochondria have thousands of copies in a cell. And so they're very powerful. The other um, power of mitochondria DNA is inherited solely from the mother. So we can use it to trace generations away. So if I have a reference sample from a great, great um, grandfather, and I want to look at the great, great grandchild, I mean, grandmother, I can, uh, I can uh, identify them possibly through the mitochondrial lineage. The Y chromosome is the alternate or the counter uh, identity of that looking for the paternal line in that, you know, it's passed on only from father to son, and we can use that as well for extended lineages and identification. Combination of two can be quite powerful in identity testing, giving us uh, values of greater than a million supporting the identity of an individual. The SNPs that I mentioned, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are the ones that we're going to see for now and in the future is playing an extensive role in identity testing, because about 85% of all the variation, 85% of those 3 million letters difference amongst individuals or between individuals is due to SNPs. And you can think of SNPs as being very powerful. There's just changes in one letter between individuals or among individuals. And sickle cell anemia would be a great example of that, where there's just one letter change in the gene for hemoglobin that causes sickle cell anemia. So these can be quite powerful and quite informative. Lastly, in a minute or so, I'll try to explain the interpretation and statistics. If we compare an evidence sample by DNA, with a reference sample, we cannot exclude that individual. It's incumbent upon us to convey to the court or to investigators what is the significance of that. And we use statistics to do that. When um, the statistics we derive from population data, and the reason we do it is that some of the variants that exist in one population may be more common in that population than another. So, for instance, in the United States, we look at several population groups, given the, you know, the melting pot of the United States, and then depending on the case, present evidence based on the frequencies in that group. And using, you know, um, genetic models and, and principles of mathematical expressions, we can estimate the occurrence of the genetic marker in the population and convey how common or rare. And depending on the marker, quality of the evidence, we can get very strong evidence in support of the identity of the individual, or it can be partial evidence or just some evidence to support an investigation for, for leads or um, at least a focus or to eliminate those who should not be included in, in the investigation. And with that, I'm giving you the five-year history or education in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. That really was no uh, easy task, and it's a complicated matter to talk about. Um, and I'm just taking notes as I'm listening so that I can sort of remember to refer to things correctly. Um, we're going to talk next to a, a forensic scientist who's going to start introducing us to principles of how some of these ideas, concepts, and, and you know, features in our cells and in our DNA are applied um, in investigations and in examinations. Um, but just a reminder to everybody who's joined us this afternoon that if you have questions for the panel, you're welcome to post them either in the Q&A box at the bottom, or you can type your questions in the chat on the side, um, and we will try and raise them as and when we get time for them. 
And we're going to have a number of different experts talking to us this afternoon. So hopefully we will actually get to address um, most people's questions as, as they raise them. We've started with a, a foundation, um, a, a small foundation, and, and I know, uh, you know, we're moving at sort of lightning speed. Um, we've started about looking at sort of what is DNA and why is it useful in terms of identifying humans? And it's not just for identification purposes, but also for exclusion purposes. So when we have DNA samples, it allows us to potentially identify who might be the person who's left that DNA trace, but it also might allow us to exclude that person. And just a reminder of what um, Bruce said there was DNA is in every cell of the body. It's found in any biological material. So it's a tool that allows us to look at any kind of biological remains. And we're focused pretty much on human remains for, for this section. Our next speaker I'm very excited to, to hear from is uh, Asha Auklu. She's a senior forensic scientist at the Forensic Science Laboratory of Mauritius. Um, she has a master's of science degree in bioinformatics and biology, uh, a postgraduate diploma in forensic DNA fingerprinting, which I'm hoping she'll ex explain a little bit more. And she's currently pursuing her MPhil or PhD in forensic geosciences. Um, Asha specializes in crime scene investigation and biological evidence analysis. She also conducts, uh, she contributes to quality assurance and control as a deputy quality manager and conducts training for police officers on various topics related to crime scene management, first officers roles and DNA awareness. So, uh, awareness. so welcome this afternoon, Asha. And if uh, you want to switch on your camera and I'll hand over to you, if you're ready. Okay, great. Yes. Good. Thank Please you. go ahead. Thank you very much yeah. for the introduction. And uh, I would say it's quite hard to talk of to Professor Bruce, but let me greet you from Mauritius and let me take you to the DNA world. So what is forensic science? It is the application of science to uh, for forensic or for criminal justice purposes. So what do we do and what is forensic DNA? Professor Bruce told about it. So let me take you from an, another perspective. So when we talk about forensic science or forensic DNA, you can all imagine that we are on a crime scene. And uh, being present on a crime scene, say a murder scene, a rape scene, or a larceny scene, we have a crime that has been committed. And for the crime that has been committed, there is a suspect and there is a per or the perpetrator and the victim. So how do we explore that application of forensic science by using DNA analysis to try to see who has been present on that particular crime scene, who has left their genetic material as explained by Professor Bruce on the crime scene, and what can we recover and gather from that particular crime scene. So just to tell you that DNA forms part of trace evidence, that is, we cannot see them from naked eye, but we uh, often have specialized enhancement technique to identify DNA. So the sources of DNA might be from abundant sources. If we are on a medicine, we can get blood, we can get hair, we can get semen sample, and, and it can be as minute as a single hair strand or where we are heading nowadays, it's about touch DNA or uh, touch DNA that is epithelial cells, analysis of epithelial cells. So just to tell you that on a crime scene, these are known as trace evidence. That is, we need to have an eye to see these evidences, to gather them before bringing to the lab for analysis. To tell you that a DNA analyst uh, is there to analyze the exhibit that is brought to the lab. But firstly, we have to have a good crime scene examination. So as it all starts from the crime scene, if we are unable to recover or see what is present on the crime scene that can be helpful for DNA analysis, then we are losing evidential material from the crime scene. So it is important to know that DNA is very sensitive, easily degraded, and can be highly contaminated. So we need to have proper protective equipment to handle, also to collect transportation, and then to deposit it to the lab. But what happens to that exhibit, to that evidence that is being brought to the lab? As mentioned by Professor Bruce, it is the genetic material, and our nature is that it is highly protected, meaning to say that we need now to get into access to that genetic material for forensic DNA uh, examination for human identification. We each have a unique set of DNA when we are talking about the STR DNA for forensic use. So what do we do? So the 
DNA samples that have been collected from the crime scene needs now to be analyzed. So what do we do? We remove, we extract the DNA, which is a simple process of eliminating the other cell material and isolating the genetic material that will be used for further examination. So once we have different techniques of uh, um, uh, DNA isolation because it depends on the source. If it is blood, there will be a separate uh, technique to examine, uh, to extract the DNA where it is going to be high amount of DNA that will be recovered, semen sample, the same type of extraction method. But when it comes to touch DNA or epithelial cells or single hair or saliva, there are different specialized methods that are used to be able to recover minute amounts of DNA that are present on the crime scene or on exhibit being brought to the lab. So what happens is that we break down the cell, we remove the DNA content that will be of use for us. After that, we need to see how much DNA do we have in that sample. So from DNA isolation, then next we move to DNA quantification. This step is very important because we need a certain amount of DNA to get a genetic profile. Because at the end of the day, what we are trying to see is to get the genetic profile of different individuals that were present at the time of the crime on the scene. Okay, so from there, we need to quantify the DNA. Quantification would mean that I need to know the amount of DNA that is present from the sample recovered. Because too much DNA is not good to obtain a DNA profile, and too little DNA also, we won't be getting any particular profile from them. So the next step analysis quantification. Now, we do the quantification using the real-time PCR process which gives us the amount of DNA in situ in the sample. From there, we'll be having an, uh, uh, a value. And from this value, we will move to the next step, which is known as the amplification. In simple words, amplification is only making millions of copies of that DNA that we have been isolating. So the next step will be multiplication, millions of copies of the DNA that has been recovered from the crime scene. I would also highlight like to highlight that this process involves the integration of different nucleotides, different dyes that will be later used for visualization. So after amplifying the DNA, then the, the samples are ready for the next step, which is electrophoresis. So nowadays we are using um, electrophoresis, so as a medium of separating the amplified product. So the basis of electrophoresis is to separate the DNA present in the sample that you remember that was collected from the crime scene or from reference sample. So we are now moving into a sieve just to separate the different weights and the different uh, samples based on the electric current. So from there, we will be getting an electrophoregram and the electrophoregram will be giving us the details of the genetic material present in that particular profile. So from there, we can have different types of profile. If all the loci that have been amplified, uh, we call it a, a full profile, we will be obtaining a full profile. If we have less than the amplified locus, so we're getting like a partial profile, and if there is no amplification, so then there will be a uh, a new profile, new DNA would be recovered. So from there, we've received the genetic profile. What's next for forensic DNA analysis? So the idea is to identify, we've identified the profile and now for comparison with reference samples. So exhibit the, from the crime scene, we're gonna compare it with reference sample of the suspect of the victim and try to identify which who was the donor of that genetic material that was recovered from the crime scene. And if you have to talk in terms of genetic profile, DNA profile, we can have a full profile, a partial profile, or no profile at all. But bear in mind that there are other uh, additional complexities that we can have. So if an exhibit has been handled by two or more persons, we will be getting a mixture profile and we have to identify who are the contributors of that particular profile deposited on the crime scene. Or we can also get a small, uh, only one that is a single source profile. So for example, I have a profile recovered from my crime scene and the suspect, I see that it is giving me a match. I can say that the genetic profile on the crime scene has been the, the donor of that genetic profile is the suspect or the victim. So just to summarize, to say that DNA evidence 
is very important because it goes back to the source, to the person who has deposited that particular genetic material. However, we need to take precautions firstly to identify the sample, to identify the exit, the where we can recover the sources of DNA, and the whole process should be contamination proof. That is wearing appropriate equipment, sterilization of equipment, and the workflow should be also time proof. That is having proper uh, audit trail, track record of who is doing each process and how at the end of the day we have valid results that will be used for comparison for the criminal justice system. So I hope that within these few minutes I was able to explain to you the process and uh, looking forward to uh, see you for the DNA conference next week. Thank you very much. We don't go anywhere yet, Asha, because I think you'll be asked questions during the next few sessions. So, sure, so um, yes. no, no, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic and such a brilliant rapid introduction to so many important concepts around um you know what 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 needs to be considered we often have sort of uh, an idea of forensic sciences that's taken very much from movies and from tv shows and the reality can be quite different um asha well i'll come back to you during the question section which will happen after our next speaker um we're going to move right along to and i think this will be a great follow up from asha um is professor ryan blumenthal um, from uh, based in Pretoria now, but um, if if we were in Germany, I would be calling him Doctor Doctor. So um, Ryan is a, a medical doctor. He's a forensic pathologist. He also has a PhD. Um, he's a, a senior forensic pathologist and associate professor at the University of Pretoria's Department of Forensic Medicine. Um, Ryan has published extremely widely in the fields of electrocution, suicide, and other areas involving the pathology of trauma. His chief mission in life is to help advance forensic pathology services, both nationally and internationally. He's published 37 articles in peer-reviewed journals. He's contributed chapters to six international textbooks, and he's written four books for the public, um, including a really fascinating one that describes his first public book that I saw a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, I think I read it during lockdown, which described his work as a forensic pathologist. Um, so, Dr. Blumenthal, if you are there, you can switch your camera on and say hello. Um, and what Ryan is going to be talking about today is, I think, following on from Asha, is discussing Locard's exchange principle and how this applies to DNA specifically. Thank you, um, Dr. Brody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is everything in, in perfectly. order here? Perfectly. Hear and um, see I, you perfectly. I just want to thank you for this and Vanessa and all the sponsors and um, yeah, and to acknowledge all my colleagues internationally. It's a huge privilege to be here and and um, yeah, it's very humbling, and I'm really looking forward to the DNA workshop next week, the the symposium. So yeah, I'm quite excited about this. So I'm a forensic pathologist. Um, yeah, my crime scene is the is the human body, the dead human body, and um, because we've got such a mixed um, audience here, I'm going to keep my language very simple. There's no slideshow. Um, I've merely been asked to discuss Locard's exchange principle. And I think, um, you know, we've all got our ideas about what low cards exchange principle is about. However, today I want to put forth another dimension to it that maybe we haven't thought about. But just to um, give you the basics. So, you know, as forensic pathologists, we literally do not leave the mortuary. We don't see other humans eye to eye. I mean, our world is literally the, the dissection table. And we can tell a lot about what's happening in the world from our mortuary table. We can tell you if a new gang has moved into a neighborhood. We can tell you if there's new or emergent drugs or diseases. Um, we can even tell you the health of the nation, all from the body, the human body. And because we deal so much with, um, you know, death and the human body, we get in, we're situated in the blind spots, I think, of, of humanity. And we get to see what's happening in the world. And our entire world is based on low cards exchange principle, which is, every contact leaves a trace. So if you go to a, a, a scene, you'll leave something there or you'll take something away from you, from that scene. So it was um, created in 1643 by Professor Edmund Lyon from, from France. And it was um, explained by um, Professor Kirk as um, you know, that there's interchange which takes place. And it is such a profound theory because literally it's, 
it's dynamic. It exists as we're talking. I mean, my ideas are being exchanged to you and you're listening. So hopefully there's interchange taking place here. But today I want to discuss the second part of low cards exchange principle, which is little known to laymen, to the media, to the public, and even to fellow scientists. And we need to keep this in mind specifically when it comes to DNA. And the second part of low cards exchange principle says that the degree of transfer depends on four things. The intensity, duration, and nature of the contact and the proclivity of the contactee. So in other words, um, you know, how uh, the, if there's an underlying um, proclivity um, to being touched by that object. So can I, can I expound upon this if I may? So just thinking in, in basic forensic terms, intensity, duration, and nature of contact, how hard, how long, what type of contact, and if there's a predisposition of the contact T to the amount of contact taking place. And this works throughout life. I mean, it works on the microscopic level, atomic level, to the cosmic level. I mean, if you think about all your great scientific theories, it's basically low cards exchange principle. I mean, you can take Young's light experiment, and it's basically the interaction of the light waves and particles with the barriers that gave us our understanding of light. If you look at the um, Unabomber case in America, it's a very famous case with Ted Kaczynski. He had a manifesto and he had letters and he had context of himself on his manifesto and context of himself on his letters and we could work out this was the same person. The entire field of palynology, pollen transfer is low cards exchange principle. If you brush a bush uh, past the bush, we can tell you where you touch that bush and if pollen transferred, etc. Even accents in humans follows low cards exchange principle. If you live in a certain area, like for example in Mauritius, you get a certain accent because you're coming in contact with the locals there, they're coming in contact there, miss a clue and you develop an accent. Low cards exchange principle works in the African bushveld. I mean, we can tell you what animals exist in the African bushveld from its spur and droppings on the ground without having to tell you what species, without even seeing the species themselves. And so too, just by walking on the beach, we can tell you what lives in that ocean without putting a single toe in the ocean, all because these creatures leave contacts and traces on its environment. If we look at health as medical doctors, no one just gets sick or dies. You have to come in contact with something, whether it's a carcinogen or an infection. And um, if, if crocodiles wash up dead in a river or seals wash up dead on a beach, as a forensic person, we need to find out what context these species had to cause their death. So low cards exchange principle is ubiquitous. It's profound, it exists every single, it, it affects every single one of us. In fact, we can even go so far as to say that your ideologies, the things that you believe is low cards exchange principle. Your ideas, you didn't come up with yourself. You came in contact with these ideas and depending on intensity, duration, and nature of contact, and your proclivity to these ideas, they became your own. So low cards exchange principle really affects all of us um, consciously and subconsciously. And, and we are going to take this concept very far at the conference and show you how DNA is the ultimate tool to catch bad guys. And I think when we look at the pursuit of truth in forensic pathology, the, the outcome is obvious. We have to use DNA to, um, in, in all our homicide cases. I mean, it's a no-brainer. And we are going to push very hard to have mandatory DNA testing for all homicide cases, specifically in South Africa. And I will try and show you that in, it, it will, it's going to take courage. It's going to take integrity. It's going to take a degree of reasonableness and respect there are 70 murders a day in South Africa. So we're looking at 70 extra DNA tests uh, uh, like a day. And I think it's just the first step that we have to take um, to in the way forward against our fight against crime. So I hope I haven't uh, affected you too much with this discussion. It's just a brief little discussion about contact. I call it contact theory. So I hope my ideas uh, weren't too hard, weren't too intense weren't too, uh, you know, the nature of them weren't too extreme and that your proclivity to accept them were 
we're in order. So thank you very much for having me and I look forward to meeting everyone next week. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, it is great. We've got our own sort of real live African CSI, but focusing on human DNA right here. Um, just a reminder, if you have questions for any of the panelists, please post them in the Q&A section or you can write them in the chat on the side. Um, and uh, you know we'll try and get them to the panelists. We're going to take a break now for questions. And I've actually we have some pre-submitted questions um, and other questions. I'm going to add on some of the questions that have come through in the meantime. And I'm going to ask them to our panelists who have already spoken. And we have uh, four additional panelists who are going to speak in the next hour of the program. Um, and just so that you know, in the next hour, we're also going to discuss not only the sort of technical processes of forensic investigations and how DNA is used, but we're just going to look at their impact in different contexts from um, facial uh, forensic facial imaging to disaster victim identification to gender-based violence. And we're also going to look at forensic and human genetic policies. So we do understand that, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. We're really looking at how these technologies are applied and what is the impact in multiple different environments. But I would like to start with some questions for uh, specific panelists. And I mean, any of the, the panelists are welcome to answer, but maybe if I could ask Bruce to start off, just if you, um, there, there was a question that, that you mentioned about sort of including, excluding um, people from, from matching. Does DNA confirm somebody's identity 100%? Well, in, in, um, it's sort of like a leap of faith issue in some ways. Um, if, you, if, if a man is standing on a curb and it's only five centimeters high, and if he believes he steps off the curb, he won't be hurt by stepping on the ground, that's, that's a pretty good reasonable assumption. If a man steps on a 3,000 foot cliff and then we're through, let's say a thousand meter cliff, and, and believes that he's gonna to fall to the ground and not be hurt, that's a different leap of faith. So in, in, when we do DNA typing, we look at the composite of genetic information and the more powerful it is, the more it leans towards identification. In the, as the statistics gets larger, the leap of faith becomes less and less and less. So as it becomes more powerful, one has greater confidence. But from a science point of view, it's always a probability. So you never say absolute, but on a practical level, it can be absolute. The one other thing is in missing persons cases, for example, in my country and many others, we provide the genetic testing, but we don't make the identification. Right. There's usually a medical examiner or a coroner or some equivalent that makes the identification that can be based on the DNA evidence on the other non-DNA evidence, which we call the metadata, or it can be based on the feeling of the individual of the day. And so identifications are made all the time, but they're combinations of information or personal beliefs. Um, and just one quick follow-up from that is, what's the difference between a partial DNA profile and a full DNA profile? Okay, it's, that's, it's a, that's that degree of probability, right, I suppose? Yeah, um, a, a full profile is also just relevant or relative to the, the type of test that's done. When I mentioned earlier, the STRs, they come in kits, usually these days between 20 and 25 markers. So if you apply that kit and you get all the markers, you have a full profile. If you get less than all the markers because the DNA is compromised, as it may be insulted by environmental conditions, be degraded, or be a very low quantity, we may get a subset of those anywhere from less than one marker to down to almost no markers to be a partial profile. Less markers, less statistical support, less degree of confidence in the identity of the individual. Thank you very much. Asha, if I can move back to you, um, we had one question that relates to your presentation, which asked was what is touch DNA? So if you could maybe just explain that, but then also following on from that is what compromises or damages DNA evidence and samples? You mentioned in your presentation that DNA is sensitive, that it's easily degraded, it's easily contaminated. So I think there's interest from the audience in 
aside from the, the kind of chain of custody, um, but how can DNA be degraded or contaminated as a sample? Um, so maybe start with there and I'll follow up after that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the question, I would say. So what is touch DNA? So as the word says, touch DNA, meaning to say, I take off from uh, Dr. Ryan's uh, presentation, that is Lockhart's principle. So it says that whenever we are in contact with something, an object or a person, there is transfer of material. So this is the basis of, of, of DNA, of forensic DNA. That is, if I'm taking my pen and I'm holding the pen for a few minutes or a few seconds, what is happening? Cells from skin cells are getting transferred to that particular pen. And if I get a pen at the laboratory, so for the examination of touch DNA, I will be swabbing this pen for different areas and using these swab for DNA analysis. So in simple terms, I would say touch DNA is the epithelial cells, the cells that are left on objects or upon touching these objects. Okay. But I would also like to highlight that we often don't get Dutch DNA from different individuals because it depends on the shedding of the person. Might be a person be shedding more skin cells than the other cells. Okay, so very often Dutch DNA is very critical and sensitive. So we need to know where to collect that Dutch DNA. And there are often cases where we don't get Dutch DNA because there has not been much transfer of genetic material from the individual to the object being touched. I hope I've answered the question for touch DNA. That's great. So the, the second question, and we're getting a few relating to this, is what degrades um, DNA samples? And this relates to a number of things. So maybe that there is a DNA sample left somewhere and it gets degraded. But there are also questions coming in about can DNA be degraded or changed you know, in the person? Um, there was a question about can taking like traditional medicine, what we would call muti in South Africa, there's a belief that taking muti can alter a person's DNA. Um, there was another question about, for example, thallium poisoning, would it alter their DNA if they shed hair or something like that? Um, so is there any way of contaminating or degrading DNA while it's still on a living person? Um, mm -hmm. that would affect their DNA. And then what degrades DNA after the, the contact has been made and after the cells have been shed? Okay. So firstly, I would like to say that uh, forensic DNA that is most common in all countries and all laboratories is nuclear DNA. That is the DNA found in the nucleus. But we also have other sources of DNA, mitochondrial DNA, that can be used, or as mentioned by Professor Bruce, single nucleotide polymorphism. So just to tell you, if there are uh, alteration based on medicine, blood transfusion, or any other chemical activity on a live person, we can, uh, uh, we can say that there are three different options where we can be using DNA. If it is not nuclear DNA, it will be mitochondrial DNA, where it is the DNA of the mother's inheritance, that is the maternal lineage, Okay, or if it is a male, we can use also Y STLs, where we can still recover the Y lineage of the person that is from the further line. Okay, and also we can use a single nucleotide polymorphism. So these are nucleotide level, uh, I would say, identification. So it is not based on the STLs. It is based on the nucleotides present in the in the body of the individual. So just to tell you that if ever. Uh, there is any alteration that won't be alteration on the four different lines. It might be on the STRs, mutations, or everything. But then we have other alternatives where we can explore for forensic analysis. And uh, reverting back to now, when we get a DNA sample from a crime scene or anything, uh, uh, the 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 post uh, uh, the. Uh, from the crime scene or from an exhibit, I would say we will compare DNA to a bottle of milk. It is as sensitive to a bottle of milk. So if we don't put it in proper condition, it will turn into curd and that won't be able, we won't be able to analyze the DNA. So it is to be protected from moisture. So whenever we get an exhibit, we recommend that the exhibit for DNA analysis is not placed in plastic bag. Why? Because plastic containers of plastic bag, they, uh, there is moisture and humidity, and these are uh, appropriate for bacterial growth, and they degrade the DNA. Exposure to UV or any other chemicals also might be uh, reasons why we don't recover DNA from an exhibit. So if they shouldn't go into plastic bags, what kind of containers should they go into? So it is paper, paper. Or That's paper. Yeah. Okay. So 
Um, I hope everyone's taking notes and I'm also thinking of, you know, writing crime scenes and in novels and things like that, where we always imagine how we think forensics works. And then when you ask, you learn something very simple, like you wouldn't put that into plastic because it might degrade the DNA sample. I do yes. actually have a, a number of other questions, but I'm wondering um, if I should sort of move on. Can I ask one last question? You do police training for collection of DNA samples. And yes. obviously I know that even in South Africa, you know, the, our um, uh, forensic officers play a critical role in, you know, assessing a crime scene and sharing that information with whether it's the pathologists or the police investigators or prosecutors later on. So what are mistakes or errors aside from the plastic and paper that can happen in collecting DNA so that it can be analyzed in a laboratory? I would enlarge that before collecting DNA, because very often our training is focused on how to uh, to manage a crime scene. That is, the police officer need to know where to put the cordon, because if they fail in putting the cordon at the right place, that would mean that we are already losing evidence. Because if we put a larger cordon, it would mean that we are preserving evidence. But if the cordon is closer to the uh, to the area where the incident has occurred. So we are ignoring other areas that might be contaminated by public access or journalists or anything. So this is the priority of how to preserve the crime scene. This is the basis. If you are able to preserve the crime scene, then you know that your crime scene is as genuine as it is, and there is no other additional sources of contamination that you will be adding. And from there, uh, it is about uh, uh, making the police officers know what is what are evidences from where we can gather DNA, the physical evidence, the trace evidences, and how should they be preserved? How should they be collected? In which container should they be packed? If the swab should be dried before collection, if you are using directly a dry swab, and also upon collection, how to locate the swabs that have been collected. Because in Mauritius, we have different system. It is the training for the police officer, that is the first officer attending, and also for the crime scene officers. So these are more trained into collecting samples and bringing samples to the laboratory. So there should be proper chain of custody that is from the police officer attending the scene of crime firstly, how he secured the crime scene, and then till the scene of crime officers get into the crime scene, how they identify identify, take photographs, take sketches, and if in major cases we are called upon the crime scene to work together with them so that we are able to optimize uh, exhibit from the crime scene. Fantastic. And then the, 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 the recording, photography, till the oh. deposit to the forensic science lab. Thank you so much, Asha. And I really look forward to talking with you more. Um, Aaron, you had your hand up. Uh, if you'd still like to talk, I'd like to introduce one of our other panelists. He's going to be talking a little later this afternoon. It's Dr. Aaron Amankwa. And uh, Aaron, did you want to respond to one of the questions? Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, lovely to meet you. I think I just had an example in mind that I wanted to flag up with uh, mistakes. And that was the Adam Scott case here in the UK, which happened in October 2011. And this is a case where there was a mistake in the laboratory. So a plastic tray that had been used to process the saliva sample of Mr. Adam Scott in an unrelated case was mistakenly used to process a sample from a rib case. And his partial profile was detected and he was therefore charged uh, and detained for the rape incident. And this occurred, I think it took quite some time for the police to realize that his phone records did not match up with the DNA evidence that they had. So I wanted to flag up the importance of maintaining the chain of custody of evidence throughout the process, all the way from the crime scene to the laboratory to even the presentation in court, and also the importance of having other corroborative evidence in addition to DNA evidence in any case at all. Thank you very much. And we'll talk again with um, Aaron in a little while. I'm gonna move on to our next session, well, our next group of panelists, because we, we have a lot to cover and it's all really, really interesting. Um, but it does affirm that importance of, uh, you know, DNA profiles, 
don't exist uh, in a vacuum. They don't exist on their own. They work within a chain of custody, a number of other investigations. And as Erin was mentioning, you know, the fact that this was contradicted by phone records. Um, so it, it's not on its own um, always sufficient proof and things can be contested. Um, but it plays a really important role in capturing the fullness, particularly of crime scene investigations. I want to start talking with our panelists, with a gr new, new group of panelists now about some of the ways in which uh, we try and process and research and deal with different types of contexts. We're going to range from criminal investigations and interpersonal violence through to um, disaster and humanitarian efforts. And I would like to start with Dr. Linda Naidu. Um, and I have noted, sorry, I know that there's still some more questions in the Q&A box on the side, and we will get to as many of the questions as we can as we go through the afternoon, but we still have quite a lot of ground to cover. So please be patient with me. Um, let me get back to Dr. Naidu. So Linda Naidu is the gender-based violence and femicide specialist working at the United Nations. She's been there for the last five years and her experiences range from being an advisor with a history of working in international child protection and the health sector. Um, currently in the gender-based violence and femicide sector, she's spearheading projects in different SADC regions, ranging from crime prevention, criminal justice, gender responsive prisons, um, and also in developing uh, and in conflict and humanitarian contexts. Um, She's published a number of articles and she's informed by a local and a global perspective, which I'm really gratified to see from all of our panelists. Dr. Naidu, are you there? Do you want to switch your camera on and uh, talk to us a little bit? We often hear about gender-based violence and femicide, but it, it feels like we talk about it more in terms of rhetoric than in terms of sort of fact and what can be done to mitigate and ultimately prevent it and investigate cases. So um, I hand over to you. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm not sure. Can you see me? Because both my camera and my mic. I can is... see you. I can. Oh, yes, I can see you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not spotlighted. So, so probably that's one of the reasons why you're not seeing too much of me. But thank you so much. I'm so excited about our symposium next week. And the, the, the interest has been overwhelming. And I think this is a this is actually the attendance today actually shows how enthusiastic and well received this particular endeavor is so it, it's really excited exciting but i also you know i'm really looking forward to to the nexus that we are presenting you know the science the justice the humanitarian context because it's so prevalent right now and i and i think it's something that everyone's welcoming with open arms so it's great to be able to be on this platform as a starting point um so, so with regards to, to gender-based violence, you know, it's, it's very nicely contextualized um, in this particular symposium for next week, but also to say that um, I, I think my, my, my the esteemed panelists have actually done a, a wonderful job in actually contextualizing, you know, precisely what we're going to be doing. And I think Vanessa's also brought in some of the, the, the important relevance that um, DNA evidence has in relation to gender-based violence. So, so with, uh, you know, gender-based violence is um, a scary phenomenon and uh, we see its prevalence really increasing in the SADC region. And, and we know that from research, it's, it's one in three people, women that are actually involved in gender-based violence. And we find that it, also from UNODC uh, research, we find that um, Africa is a continent where women are most likely to be killed by families and by, by, by their partners both intimate partners, but also strangers. And, and this is scary because we also find that uh, this is really an underreported phenomenon. We find that uh, only for 40%, we find 40% of women don't report this particular crime. And so when we look at the context of DNA evidence and how we can really support these particular cases, I think it's amazing. I think we can actually do so much more in actually collaborating those particular cases with DNA evidence. And if we look at why as well, you know, women don't report. And I think looking at some of the questions in the, in the chat, I think it's most prevalent that I just respond to, to this particular reason why women don't, you know, we you don't respond or don't report. Um, they kind of numb that pain and go on living through the experiences. But this also allows uh, impunity to happen where uh, perpetrators don't get punished 
for what they do. And they go on in lots of instances to, to actually continue offending and abusing other women. And we find that, you know, because of the issues of gender inequality, where a woman is not adequately respected, and because they are the social uh, norms and myths and stereotypical behavior, cultural norms that entrap particular women, they don't report. And when they report, there's blaming, a lot of blaming issues, and, 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 and also coercion into retracting what she says. And then also it's regarded as the men has been the, the head of the household and women are dependent on resources. So why report this particular, particular case? So it becomes very, very challenging. And, and when we have these particular cases go into the, the court setting as well, we find that, you know, without uh, collaborative information, we, we don't actually ultimately get a conviction. And, and there are many, many factors and variables that actually lead to supporting a particular case. And, and when we look at um, when we look at uh, trauma, trauma is a science in itself. Trauma is a science that affects how a woman is actually affected by this particular uh, uh, particular trauma by being violated. And, and sometimes, when you look at a particular case, we find right at the outset it's rejected. So we find attrition levels are really concerning. Besides the ultimate end of actually having very, very low convictions of every reported case. So we find that uh, when a woman actually, or I'm saying woman because women are disproportionately affected. Gender-based violence affects everyone, but uh, globally, women are more disproportionately affected by gender-based violence. And we find in particular that, um, you know, there needs to be a coordinated collaborative support to a particular uh, survivor, right from having the family support that person to be able to recover and, and work through a particular case and report it, but also the community. And we find in most instances, there isn't this particular support, which, which actually ends up uh, making or uh, causing this particular person to retract that particular case. Also, you know, when you look at the collaborative support that a particular survivor requires, it stems from actually the health sector, the social development sector, the law enforcement, as well as the criminal processes constituting the court processes with prosecutors, as well as, as judicial officers. And that is why forensic evidence can do so much to, to, to actually profile uh, a particular perf a per perpetrator, identify who they are, because you know, in a very, very simplified way of actually saying it, it's a very simplified way of saying it, um, you know, DNA evidence is like breadcrumbs. You know, we leave, it's very individuated. We leave it wherever we are. It's, it actually can denote where we are, what we've done, who we are in actually performing a particular act. Very, very simplified. And so this particular offender or perpetrator can be identified, can be convicted. And, 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 and it can actually prevent and safeguard many other potential victims. But in having said that as well, you know, DNA evidence is, is not the only source of evidence that can actually lead to a conviction. And we need to actually take cognizance of that as well, because we need to be able to have a broader context of evidence. But just to say that, you know, um, a recent case that we had in South Africa, where a particular child uh, indicated that she was sexually violated, sexually molested by a community member. And with DNA evidence, it was actually determined no, it was her uncle that really uh, uh, abused her. So, so really, you know, DNA evidence has such a fundamental role to play in collaborating evidence, but also in the wider uh, process of actually working as an investigative tool in supporting that particular evidence. So in having said that as well, you know, we need to be able to look at the whole stream of support to a particular victim. We need to be able to look at how a person is actually supported through her trauma, to be able to actually look at how, how that trauma is understood and presented adequately in the courtroom as well. Because one always thinks that, you know, the victim should have screamed, the victim should have been able to support herself, and why didn't she? And we look at the science of trauma and we understand that Sometimes when trauma, when, 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 uh, when, when survivors are affected, they freeze, they're not able to respond, they're not able to protect themselves. But also that particular 
post-traumatic stress disorder perpetuates. So even when they go to court as well, you know, um, law enforcement and criminal justice uh, um, personnel are expecting to see a very coherent collaborative story about what the, um, the, the service survivor has actually experienced. And if they don't provide that uh, co coherent story, they think maybe it hasn't happened. Then they find loopholes and gaps in that process. So, you know, and, and you can't expect a survivor to be able to, to construct a very perfectly orchestrated story because trauma has its effect of affecting memory and affecting coherency. And, and, and hence, then again, I would actually justify why DNA profiling, why DNA evidence plays this incredibly important role in collaborating that particular evidence. Um, there were two questions in the chat around trafficking and, and um, child marriages. And I want to just elaborate on the issue of child marriages. Yes, it is uh, a huge issue in the SADC region, but it's a huge issue globally. And it is a rapidly escalating issue. It is an issue that sometimes was deemed as a cultural issue, but we also find right now with the issues of poverty, it's a rapidly escalating issue. People sell their children because they can't provide for them, they can't support them and because they need that particular income to support the rest of the family. But just to say that as well, in the static region, we have a model law on child marriages to be able to actually show uh, what can be done preventatively, but also within the criminal justice process, what can be, due to, can be done to actually uh, prosecute those particular cases. So there's a whole array of, of, of activities can be, that can be done to prevent this particular activity. Same with trafficking as well. You know, trafficking is um, an activity that largely can be very lucrative. One of the most lucrative, uh, lucrative, lucrative activities in the world next to drug trafficking. And although there are lots of campaigns and awareness of how one can actually address the issues of trafficking, how we can prevent it, how we can support the particular victim in the issues of trafficking, how we can prevent it. But sadly, we find that, you know, um, it's the, the, it is, you know, a victim survivors are always entrapped in a particular situation. So like we found in a recent research, um, you know, there was an attractive advert about young girls trying to apply uh, for a modeling job. And we found that ultimately it was trafficking. You know, it was actually a scheme of trafficking. So when we look at DNA investigation in the face of, of GBV, you know, it plays, this particular science plays such an incredibly important role because of the, the individuating factor. But I'm not gonna to speak too much about the science. I think we have so many experts that can speak so eloquently around this, so proficiently around this. So I'm gonna leave it at that and I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you so much, and I look forward to talking more at the symposium. Just a reminder for the journalists um, anywhere, in fact, if you'd like to contact any of the experts and the panelists here, all that will be at the symposium next week, you can please email media at dnaforafrica.com and submit a request because there will be opportunities for one-on-one -on -one interviews in person or via Zoom. Um, and there are an array of incredible forensic and DNA experts that will be attending next week um, from all over the world, but also all over Africa. And really important that we reflect the reality of um, interpersonal interactions and of justice systems and scientific processes that are available to us in different countries. Um, one of the important things that one of the impacts, the most important potential applications of forensic DNA technologies isn't just for criminal investigations, although we do often in our minds and in our narratives, I think, focus a great deal on interpersonal violence and finding perpetrators of crimes. Um, but also, and I think this is particularly relevant as climate change and the impacts of man-made climate change worsen acro across the world. We're seeing more frequent and more intense natural disasters. So large-scale humanitarian events, large-scale disasters, and of course, conflicts, which are also man-made disasters of a different form. Um, DNA profiling can play a very important role in assisting first responders and um, identifying uh, and reuniting um, people with their loved ones. And so at this point, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Stephen Fonseca. He's with the uh, ICRC. Um, the International Center for the Red Cross. And Stephen uh, was a coroner in Canada for 16 years, 
before joining the ICRC's forensic team in 2013. He's currently the manager of the ICRC's African Center for Medical Legal Systems, and he'll probably explain a little bit more what that means. He His career has included more than 25 years in medical legal death investigations, and he has extensive experience working with missing persons and the dead, including unidentified bodies in conflict, migration, and disasters. And I think these are issues that are becoming increasingly prominent um, in the African landscape. So Stephen, if you want to switch on your camera and... Go. Thanks, Nakama. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, this is a great opportunity. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening in. And um, the previous panelists have been absolutely fantastic, making a very complicated subject matter very understandable to all of us. Um, yeah, I'm going to turn it around a little bit and talk about, you know, when we uh, when we learn about science and we, we earn our degrees and we become these forensic investigators, forensic scientists, I think what we fail to learn very early in our in our studies and in our careers is the true impact of forensics. We all understand that forensics is incredibly important for criminal justice systems. We all want perpetrators, the right, uh, the correct perpetrator held accountable. And forensic science definitely is, is the, the, the conduit to that process and to ensure accountability. But over the years, what I have truly understood is that We've kind of missed um, we've missed the the true professors um, in 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 our sort of our learning path, and that is the families and the community. And so, of course, DNA and other forensic techniques are so incredible. Uh, so the advancements are so so exciting. They are providing um, a, a wide variety of victims, both um, the accountability and the justice that they seek but they're also having a tremendous impact on reducing the suffering. And, I'm, and I mean true suffering that can go on for decades and decades and decades. If we look outside of the courtroom, think of as Nahama has mentioned and as a few of the other panelists have talked about, how many people have lost a loved one? How many people are actively looking for someone that is missing in their life? Think of how many people are waiting outside a mortuary today, hoping to claim a loved one, hoping that that person was correctly identified and that they could take this loved one. We learn, and the RCRC termed this phrase, although we are certainly not the ones who invented the concept, but we term um, the work that we do outside of the courtroom and outside of the court process as humanitarian forensic action. This is action where we are focusing on the victim. We are focusing on the community and how forensics plays a, a very positive role, um, how DNA and other technologies actually help them find some resolution to, to a number of the challenges that, that they're facing. But also we start to understand how forensic science needs to be applied in a very humanitarian way. Forensics, you know, the processes are very scientific and very rigid, but they're always impacting someone. And so that's why it's so important um, when we look at humanitarian forensic action and how we apply forensic sciences, we also understand how the community needs to be involved in these processes. We need to understand the religion, the culture, the traditions, the many aspects that even have an impact on whether a family or a community accepts the results of all of the science that is sometimes applied to casework. So in the ICRC, um, I don't know that we would call it a privilege, but we have a, a, a mandate to, to enter conflict areas. There are wars and there is conflict throughout the world. Hundreds of thousands of combatants are killed Many, many civilians are killed in the process, caught in the crossfires, involved in many other types of incidents, whether accidental or intentional. There's, there are so many people who desperately need what we rely on every day for our courtrooms to be applied to their situations. A combatant needs to be identified and often they're not even visually recognized by the, by the very nature of their injuries. So DNA becomes so important. 
without being too graphic, there are times when people aren't even complete and their body parts need to be reassociated with them. And so again, in many cultures and religion in certain religious groups, having the entire body returned to them is incredibly important. Spiritually, it's so important. And so this the the the, the advents in forensic science has really, um, I think, mobilized uh, society to take a second look at ensuring that the humanitarian needs of the families of the missing, of the dignity of those who are dead, of those who are in situations where they are indeed suffering for a number of different reasons, whether it's conflict, whether it's because they've lost people through migration, or even in disasters, they these people really need to have those same services, the same signs, um, the same benefits of, of these applications applied to this scenario. And I come back to how important families are in teaching us how, how forensic science needs to be applied and, and what effect it has on their lives. Um, I've, been, I've been fortunate to have investigated cases where families have been looking for loved ones for four or five decades. You can imagine the power um, of science and the effect of that science that after four decades, we can return a five-year-old child's remains back to the family when they had almost lost all hope, but never stopped searching. Um, so DNA and forensic sciences, there's lots of great forensic tools and the technology has increased so much. And when we apply it in a multidisciplinary way, I think we really are able to, to meet so many of the humanitarian needs that families are facing all over the world, the families that desperately need to find that loved one, to find the answers of what happened to someone, to ensure that we actually can prevent people from going missing. Again, understanding how people died, as, as Ryan said, knowing what caused people's deaths, that requires us to know who died. Identities of the survivors and identities of the dead are Equal or just as important to understanding what actually uh, ident what actually had happened to them, and how we can ensure that learning from their demise, learning from their tragedy, we use this to prevent um, those similar occurrences from reoccurring. So humanitarian forensic action is really a you know, really applying forensics in a truly humanitarian spirit, not necessarily looking at prosecution while we fully support that, but looking at the needs, the, the true spiritual and humanitarian needs of the individual, um, the family and the community. So I'll stop there and allow off, uh, opportunity for questions. Thanks, Nakama. Thank you so much. That was great and actually quite moving um, and a reminder of the you know you talked about the sort of multidisciplinarity required for the handling of this and i think that in a sense that also addresses so many of the questions that are coming up in the chat on the side are can you know a person's dna if they've had a transplant and can if this and can and there are many obviously different situations where dna can be affected but it's a reminder that the dna evidence that can that is available is never taken on its own and that it plays a part in so many in so it has to be affirmed by other evidence connected to other processes and always positioned within a much broader context and that's again why i'm extremely gratified that this is a, a dna for africa symposium where we're talking about the requirements and the realities of these processes and the environments on the African continent and not only looking at what happens in the global north. Um, I'm going to move on to our next panelist, um, who I'm really uh, intrigued to see and to listen to this presentation. Um, even though I actually know the panelist, her work is, is something that's quite new to me and I hope to learn a lot more. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Smith. She's an interdisciplinary visual and forensic artist and the chair of the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Stellenbosch where she also directs VizLab, which is a research space focusing on forensic facial imaging and art and science interactions. She's a founding member of the Western Cape Cold Case Consortium and a visiting research fellow at FaceLab um, at Liverpool's John Moores University in the UK. And I just want to expand here that um, Catherine's doctoral thesis 
was called Laws of the Face, and it engaged a global network of international participants and extensive fieldwork across three continents to provide grounded evidence for improvements in forensic post-mortem identification read through a socio-cultural lens, considering cross-cultural depictions of the dead across international sites, and the largely misunderstood and underutilized role of forensic art in human identification. So with that, um, Catherine, I really look forward to hearing more about uh, your work. Go ahead. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction, Nehama, um, and thanks for everyone here who's listening. Um, so some of you might be wondering what on earth is an artist doing um, in this room of predominantly scientists? Um, and that is because my work has found a way of intersecting um, the, 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 the function of forensic art, which is essentially to produce imagery that can assist in um, investigations, usually in identifying people, whether they are suspects, in inverted commas, persons of interest, or people that are unknown in death. So those are the two kind of um, forks in the road, shall we say, in terms of forensic art. Um, I, like Nehama said, um, specialize in post-mortem identification. That's my, my key area of interest. Um, and of course, what has been um, impacting the work that we do um, in the world of forensic facial imaging, um, technology is moving very, very fast. Um, and so the, while the methods and principles of much of what we do um, remain pretty consistent, um, the technologies with which we are able to do this um, are changing and you know, AI and things like that are, are having an impact. Um, I do also want to make it very clear that I'm not talking about facial recognition in terms of computer facial recognition systems. That's a different subject. Um, but just to stick with forensic facial imaging, when we don't know the identity of a person and we don't have any other means of um, identifying that person. So someone is the eyewitness to a crime or they're the victim of a crime and they might sit with a forensic artist to develop a facial depiction of their aggressor, attacker, et cetera. Or in identification and depiction of the dead, um, we might work with a facial reconstruction based on skeletal remains if other so-called primary methods of identification have failed. And of course, DNA is the gold standard, one of the, the gold standard um, of primary methods of scientific identification. Others, other panelists have mentioned, so uh, dental records and, and fingerprints. Um, but what has happened in the world of forensic genetics is DNA phenotyping. And I did spot a question um, in the Q&A, which I will try and answer um, as I get through these remarks. So forensic DNA phenotyping um, has a major, I'll explain what that is um, in a second, but it has a major advantage over your comparative DNA identification, which, which Prof. Bruce spoke about, because as we know, with comparative identification, you need a comparative a reference sample for comparative analysis. But what forensic DNA phenotyping um, is able to do is offer additional information um, that we can now map. I say we, I'm not the scientist that does this. I receive the information from scientists um, to include in my depictions. But it's possible to now map externally visible human characteristics, call them EVCs, um, such as skin eye and eye color, natural hair color, some facial features can be inferred, male baldness pattern, um, and even height can be inferred. Now, one of the facial features which is interesting is whether or not you have freckles. Um, and what um, DNA phenotyping is, enables me to do as a facial imaging expert is provide me with increased confidence in terms of the presentation of forensic facial depictions of unknown persons. This is because working from the skull alone, for example, in a facial reconstruction, there's a lot of information we can glean from what we call anatomical patterning. Everyone's skull is unique. But in terms of the external visible data, um, there's a lot that we don't know. We don't know some of those things from the skull alone that, that DNA uh, phenotyping can, in fact, um, tell us. And we've seen how this has, um, has impacted certain uh, historical depictions of historical people. So this is obviously not in a forensic context, but if 
when I think about the, the work that uh, was done to reconstruct the face of King Richard III, um, the initial reconstruction was based on um, the analysis without uh, forensic genetics. And that depiction was then updated once the phenotyping information came back and there was an adjustment made to how the, the historical depiction showed eye color and, and hair color. Um, we also seeing that this technology has been commercialized. Um, this is not a, an advertisement <laughs> for this particular company, but some of you as journalists who follow this work might be aware of um, Parabon Nanolabs that are um, releasing composites um, and, and facial depictions using this technology. And what I will be talking about in the symposium is both the, the opportunities that this um, DNA phenotyping offers forensic facial imaging, but also where some of the challenges come in and how we need to like pause for thought a little bit around the, the kind of claims um, that we associate with DNA, um, the, its authority, that it's a gold standard, and how, and this is the most important part for me, and then I will end, um, is the way in which DNA is forcing us to reconsider some key concept in the biological profile, which is sex and ancestry. So I don't know if I should say more about that or, or leave that um, for questions. It's a bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm not entirely clear. It's maybe just touch on it. You've got, you've got okay. time, go for it. Okay, so what DNA can um, present us with, okay, let me rewind for a second. When we have unidentified remains, um, a forensic anthropologist will usually develop a biological profile based on an osteological assessment. So they're, they're looking at the bones. I, as a forensic artist, um, will be provided with their reports to develop a facial reconstruction. Now, forensic artists, don't all have the same kind of training, but if we, if one is lucky enough to have training in craniofacial analysis, which is a kind of super specialization of, um, of biological anthropology, um, we may come to a different conclusion to the forensic anthropologist or interpret their findings differently in respect of what is referred to in the field as ancestry or population affinity. Um, and so we need to be cognizant, my point here is, is we just need to be cognizant of the possibility that depending on how the forensic anthropologist expresses their findings, that a biological profile where you determine age, sex, ancestry, um, could be subject to cognitive bias if depending on how you interpret those findings visually. So if the forensic anthropologist's report says Asian male, um, well, what does Asian male look like because that is an extremely broad spectrum. So what you'll find in some of the phenotyping is it'll it'll claim an, an ancestry um, that is what one could refer to as like a biogeographic contribution <laughs> in terms of what makes up our um, genetic history, as it were. And really the point here is that to conflate the idea of biological ancestry with the false notion of race, you run into you run into problems because a person's percentage of ancestry, which is often how it's expressed in one of these phenotyping um, samples that I've seen, will not always match how someone appears um, on the outside. And then we might also um, have the additional challenge that someone's bio the a DNA profile might tell you that this person, their biological sex is male but they might be female presenting in life. And if we're talking about the ethics and actually the practicalities of doing identification, we need to be cognizant of the fact that biological sex and gender presentation are obviously not always the same thing. Thank you for tackling quite a challenging topic. A lot of people are um, wary, I think, of approaching it, um, but it's an important question. It's important that we keep on talking about these themes. Um, you know, it is Pride Awareness Month in many places in the world, and these are questions that actually do have extreme relevance for all of the purposes that we're talking about now, where we're talking about whether criminal investigations or humanitarian efforts, um, working with families and things like that, is... Um, I remember years ago, Himla Sudial telling me that, you know, your DNA doesn't tell you who that person is. It doesn't tell you about mm. their identity. And, um, you know, we need to keep reminding ourselves. I, I think one of the best metaphors I can think of now, maybe for the academics that are here, or if you've heard of the turn it in, 
which assesses matches sort of plagiarism <laughs> in in student submissions now if you if you're using turnitin you know that it's an inaccurate science but if you're skilled at, at assessing it you can see where turnitin shows you what the matches are with other texts but if you're if you're a scientist and you're used to looking at it you also know where turnitin has been wrong and i think mm. somebody somebody in the comment section was saying about how they wouldn't rely on ai i also wouldn't rely on ai for anything at this point, um, first of all, it doesn't, AI doesn't exist, but uh, yeah. But in fact, this introduces us to our next speaker, and I'm going to move along to um, uh, Dr. Erin Amankwa, who is you joining us from the UK, um, I'm assuming. Uh, yes, I am. And so Erin um, uh, is an assistant professor in forensic sciences at Northumbria University, and he has an academic background in forensic biology with research experience in DNA profiling and forensic DNA legislation and policy. And through his research, Aaron has contributed oral and written evidence, reviewed policy reports on forensic biometrics for groups and agencies, including the Scottish Independent Advisory Group on Biometrics, the Forensic Genetics Policy Initiative, the Parliamentary Office on, uh, of Science and Technology, and the Office of the Biometrics Commissioner, the New Zealand Law Commission, Independent Review Panel on the DNA Laws of Victoria in Melbourne in Australia and the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights of the OSCE in Poland. And uh, his consultancy reviews have informed the development and introduction of new laws on forensic DNA and biometrics, such as the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Act of 2020. And this is a really important discussion point, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to also contextualize a little bit of ethics and law, um, and I'm hoping Vanessa can join us again once you finish to also talk about that, is DNA exists within the human society, and the way we regulate it and the way we use it isn't only about the science, it's also very much about marrying science and ethics and law. So I'm hoping you'll talk a little bit more about that, Erin, and I hand over to you. All right, thanks Nehama and uh, hello everyone, lovely to uh, meet you all. And I think picking up from the ideas that have been shared by my learned colleagues, I think the most important message that I want to pass across is that DNA evidence plays a crucial role in the investigation of uh, offenses, especially in offenses against the person, such as rape, for example, or in violent assault. However, if we do not have an appropriate legislative framework or policy to govern the use of forensic DNA, an innocent person may go to jail or a guilty person may go scot-free. And picking up on the idea uh, shared by my colleague about a match versus identity, I think the first most important thing that we have to recognize is that a DNA match does not automatically mean identification, or a DNA match does not mean that a person is guilty or a person committed a particular offense. And I'll just give an example. Um, one of the things that we scientists recognize, and I think uh, Professor Bruce Padoli mentioned this about the use of statistics in the interpretation of DNA evidence. One of the things we have to recognize is that there's the possibility of what we call adventitious matches or chance matches. And an example I can give is a case that happened here in the UK and is the Raymond Easton case in 1999. Now, this is a, a, a middle-aged man who, had, uh, who was in the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. And he was charged for a burglary offense in a town which was about 100 miles away from where he lived. And because of his condition, he was unable to walk more than 10 meters without any assistance. So the key question here was how could he commit burglary over 100 miles away from his home? And the reason for this charge was a DNA match, uh, which at the time they were looking at six different parts of the DNA and that was sufficient for the police to be able to establish whether there's a match or not. And the estimated uh, chance, random match probability for that particular uh, sample was around one in 37 million. So eventually his solicitor convinced the police to run a different DNA analysis with more advanced technology. And interestingly, he was excluded 
as a potential uh, offender in that particular case. So that example establishes the point of understanding that a match does not automatically mean identification or a match does not mean that a person is guilty of an offense, for example. And this is very important for scientists to recognize or the police to understand as well when we are looking at DNA evidence in casework. The second point that I want to also highlight is kind of related to this concept of a Lucas exchange principle. And I think my learned colleague mentioned the second part of it, which we have to pay attention to as well. And modern uh, interpretation of forensic evidence has come with the evolution of this concept of transfer and persistence. And interestingly, uh, if we find any DNA evidence from a crime scene, currently, we don't have a reliable method for us to determine the mechanism of transfer or how that DNA came to be present at the scene or on an item. Now, what we know is that it could have been deposited before the incident took place. It could have been during the incident or even after the incident happened. Another part of it is this persistence. So if we find DNA evidence or even biological material from a scene, it does not automatically mean that it is attributed to the time that the incident occurred. And we do not have reliable methods for us to be able to determine the time since the position of DNA or any biological material. So again, it could have been before or it could have been during or after the incident took place. And when we look at transfer, what we understand now is that there can be direct transfer. So where there's direct contact, there can also be indirect contact or secondary means by which DNA may be present on an item, for example. So if I shake your hand, there's a chance that I may shed my skin cells. And if you touch something else, you may transfer my skin cells onto that item, even though I have not touched it directly. So we have to recognize these challenges when we are evaluating evidence. And it is very, very important that the law recognizes these challenges so that we understand the limitations of DNA evidence and how best we can use it in any case work. The additional issues as well uh, that we also have to consider like the sensitivity of DNA samples. So currently uh, several jurisdictions and countries are considering destroying the DNA sample after a DNA profile has been generated. And I think I will expand on this concept during the DNA symposium uh, next week. And I think we have very limited time, but the most important thing that I want to uh, uh, note is the fact that we don't have to use DNA evidence in isolation. We must always consider other corroborative evidence as well when we are evaluating evidence so that we can contribute to the investigations. So I think that will be all for me. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Erin. That was brilliant um, and so interesting and um, a, a really great platform to discuss uh, some very, very important concepts. Prof. Bruce, you have your hand up. Would you like to say something? Yes, I'd, I'd just like to expand on what Aaron raised because he, he raised a very important point. Let's start with the database. That was an issue of searching a database to identify a source of a sample and not taking in consideration the chance of observing the sample given the size of the database. So if you were to estimate it, there was a one in six chance of getting a match to somebody who has that profile, whether it's the true source or just as, as he described an adventitious hit. The reason I raise this is, is that we all have biases and we have to overcome our biases to ensure that we, we deal with the evidence in a proper way. If you believe so strongly in your DNA that you ignore alternative possibilities or that your DNA searching database is the ultimate answer, you can come to a wrong conclusion. So we always have to think about alternate explanations that are reasonable alternate explanations, not crazy ones or ridiculous ones, but what some that could be considered in, in the context of the case. In this database one, the, they should have at the time considered alternate ones, but 
the runners of the database, the maintainers of the database said, oh, this is a match, go out and arrest him. Not even thinking about the considerations and only after going out and, and seeking to arrest the individual did they say, whoops, maybe something is wrong. So their biases about identity could have impacted their decision process as opposed to looking it in context. And we have Thank to think you. about that all the time in yeah. the work we do, whether it's the uh, touch DNA or transfer or whatever. I'm also just remembered that I think for next week's symposium, although there isn't any space for uh, additional delegates to attend, but the symposium presentations are going to be live streamed next week so that people who are watching this now, if you feel like you want to watch more of the expert presentations next week, you should also be able to, to join uh, online, um, register to join online next week, but you'll need to ask, we'll check in with DNA for Africa. Um, but this raises a, a very important issue about DNA shouldn't be used in isolation. Um, but I want to ask Vanessa to rejoin us for a moment, if she will, and to say, you know, there's there's this push and pull here, which is the, the push is we need to build DNA databases. Um, there was a question on uh, the chat earlier, which was, could we take people's DNA at birth, for example, and build population level DNA databases? So on the one hand, we need these DNA databases because they could potentially serve so many purposes. However, who owns that data and how do we safeguard it and prevent against the misuse? So deliberate misuse or the accidental misuse? Mm, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, and this is going to be addressed, as you said, there's a block on DNA data databases next week. Um, traditionally, uh, the criminal offender database has been your, your DNA database of, of choice when countries adopt a policy. And in saying that, just remember that if you don't have a policy in place, but you are de doing DNA casework, which many countries in Africa do, just remember you're actually doing that in an unregulated environment. So many countries go, oh my goodness, we're not going to pass laws because the state holds the information, but actually they already hold the information and they are already processing and owning data without regulations in place. Therefore, adopting a policy that regulates that is actually a very good idea. And it, it talks to, um, you know, the retention policies of the, of the profiles, of the samples, of the expungement and the destruction policies too. So they actually are very good things in terms of safeguarding information, which naturally is held by the state when the state is prosecuting or using it for identification purposes. Now, I mentioned that traditionally offender databases are often referred to as the DNA database, but we're seeing now a push towards separating them, which I think is a very good idea. Humanitarian databases are for identification of human remains and missing persons, offender obviously for the identification of suspects or an investigative lead as to you know, who was present at a crime scene, as, as Aaron said, not that they're guilty, but who was present. Now, iFamilia, which is an Interpol, based uh, DNA database um, has implemented this because if you think about it in South Africa, if somebody is arrested for a crime and their profile is on that database, but then in another instance or their offender, um, a family member goes missing and they want to come forward um, at a later stage or if they've committed a crime to put their DNA profile on the database in the event that it may um, create some investigative lead through a familial search to the identification of the human remains. They're going to be reluctant to do that as a result of them maybe being implicated in a crime. So separating the two allows the profile to be searched against the offender database for offenses or suspected offenses and for the humanitarian aspect to be able to do familial searches um, and enable um, families to be able to come forward for completely different purposes to identify missing persons or human remains. So yes, the regulation, the separation, all of these things are, um, are, are something that um, needs, needs to be considered and a policy is really what most countries need to start with. Okay, absolutely critical. And thank you. You explained that really, really well. We do have, um, we, we have actually hit our the end of our time, but I'm hoping that some of our panelists will still be able to stay with us for maybe five or 10 minutes more. We do have a number of questions that we haven't been able to get to yet uh, from the audience and questions that were submitted beforehand. And I'd really love the chance to, to talk through them. Um, and at the very, very end, I'd also maybe like Bruce and Catherine just to consider talking about you know uh, what comes next what can we see in the future um but starting off with 
uh, maybe following on from, from where Vanessa was talking, um, there has been a lot of interest recently in um, private DNA analysis. So ancestry websites, you know your ancestry and you know send off your, your cheek swab. Um, and I, I would be sort of quite interested in hearing maybe one or two of the panelists respond to their thoughts on the roles, you know, and the protections and the types of technologies that are, are used there, or unless this is maybe too much of a, I don't know if it's a hot button or not, but I, I do feel like more people are aware of sort of ancestry DNA websites that are commercially operated rather than state managing, you, you know, data. Anyone would like to respond to that? And Erin, I did see earlier on you had your camera on, and I was hoping maybe you were going to continue talking about uh, something that Vanessa was saying. I'm not sure if you do want to add something there. Um, I, I think Vanessa probably said uh, what I had in mind, but uh, it was about regulation, uh, the importance of regulation and also having a legislative framework in place before starting to implement any DNA database, for example. And I think the other thing I wanted to also mention is that um, we have to think beyond national DNA databases and think about the exchange of DNA data as well, and even forensic DNA data. Here in Europe, they have what they call the EU Prune Exchange, DNA exchange system. And this is because now the world is becoming more or less a global village. People commit international crimes, for example. So if we have and sort of a form of exchange system or a framework to govern that, that will allow us to be able to share, uh, for example, DNA results and for us to have a common call loci, for example, across countries in Africa. So I think that is something else that we have to think about. And I think I'll, I'll explain this in a bit more uh, in the symposium as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Bruce, are you going to talk about one of the questions? Nagami, yes, uh, you wanted to ask about ancestry. Well, ancestry has been a research topic and an application topic for a number of years. There are these direct to consumer companies in the US, such as 23andMe, Ancestry.com, MyHeritage, who actually will take your DNA, analyze it, and give you something, information about your biogeographical ancestry, whatever that means sort of an ethnic affinity or association. There have also been research in a number of forensic laboratories in this area as well for a number of years. To do this, you need reference samples. You need populations that represent an area. So for instance, in the early days of this, I took the test and um, as it was using bio ancestry markers, and it came back as 93% European and 7% African, Sub-Saharan African, and my phenotype wouldn't necessarily support that I would be 7% African. And the reason for that is, is that the databases that were at the time were Europeans, where it was a Swedish database, and my, my ethnic ancestry comes from Eastern Europe. So I fit pretty well into the European group, but not completely. So that little bit of extra left over doesn't quite fit. It had to fit somewhere else. So given that they had a Nigerian database or a Chinese database, they fit me into the Nigerian database. So 7% by default. These are all limited to the work that we get. It's possible maybe I do have African ancestry. Um, later tests would prove otherwise, um, but the tests themselves have their limits based on what we have data for. So you have to take it in, in the, with a grain of salt, unless you have good data. If you have good data, that would be good. Uh, we have tests in the US where people were claiming they could tell what tribe people came from from Sub-Saharan Africa. And I don't think they were quite valid because of the limited data that were available. If we had the data, maybe it could be better. Thank you, a very nice um, and considered response. This actually links back to the next question, which I'll open up to um, any of the, the panelists who are particularly working with crime scene investigation. 
and with um, legal practices related to this. There have been a number of questions about cold case investigations using DNA, and I'm going to link through a couple of other questions that were sent through to us earlier, which is um, many countries in Africa uh, have high rates of interpersonal crime, high rates of violent crime. I'm thinking South Africa, Lesotho um, also has that. Um, but we don't always necessarily have advanced forensic technology, or if we do, in the case of South Africa, we know that we have a massive backlog in terms of the processing of forensic cases. So I would love to get a response from um, people working in, in sort of forensic investigations. Um, is, is there value in taking DNA samples, if we could, from crime scenes that are happening now and saving them and hoping that in some time in the future we will have sufficient forensic processing technology? Um, or should we be pushing for other forensic techniques? You know, sh sh should we be asking for DNA processing techniques now or should we be focusing on maybe more basic and less technical or less technological forensic investigation techniques to help solve and resolve criminal cases in countries that don't always have labs that can process samples. Um, and a follow-up question to that was also, we've mentioned the um, inter-country uh, databases and samples, as I was also interested in terms of legal validity of if you have a DNA sample that has been analyzed in one country, would that be recognized, is that recognized generally in other countries um, from a legal perspective? So this is open to anyone in the panel. I see Asha had popped up, so I'm gonna let her go first. Okay, thank you, Professor. So I would just like to share a practice that we do in Mauritius, especially with regards to cold cases. Well, at the laboratory, all samples that are isolated, one part of it is sent for the DNA analysis, and then the bulk extract is kept for further analysis. So I would say that we have cases that uh, are there for 30 to 40 years, but haven't been analyzed with the new technologies. And in certain core cases in Mauritius, there have been requests to use the latest technology to analyze these samples. So from there, we still have the extract and we can implement the new technology on the sample and get, and get results that were not available 10 years ago and improve upon the quality of DNA analysis now we have touch DNA, we have YSTRs, and we have um, mini filers. So these are kits that we use to work on core cases, just try to recover DNA and uh, DNA profile that can be used today uh, that were collected years ago. Thanks, Bruce. Do you want to carry it, take it up from there? Yeah, the, the 19th century was known as the century of chemistry. The 20th century was known as the century of physics, and the 21st century is and will be known as the century of biology. The technologies that are advancing in our world today are, are phenomenal. I've been there since the beginning of DNA typing for the last 40 years, which means I'm old and feeble. But um, other than that is that we have seen tremendous strides and advances in technology and capabilities that one couldn't even have thought of as possible when the field started and even just a few years ago. And there are technologies today that have they've been burgeoning in the number of cases that you call them cold cases, which is a terrible term. We should, we should stop using those terms because they send the wrong meaning. I prefer unresolved or uh, cases or unsolved cases, but um, that could not be solved. And technologies with genetic genealogy, high, you know, high throughput sequencing, make it possible. And there will be further advances that we're all working on to this date that are being used um, routinely. So you should always collect evidence regardless. If you can't use it today, you might be able to use it tomorrow. Um, or you in your jurisdiction may not be able to use it, but others may. And it's just a technology transfer or commitment by uh, an, a, an organization or agency to do so. So um, whether it's this technique or another technique, when it comes to identity testing, you're not going to do better than DNA for the future. There have been work with proteins. They have some success. So there may be other ways of going back to the old marker approaches with uh, more exquisite typing. But the technology in DNA is not finalized. There will be many more uh, inventions, innovations that will help people to do better. 
That's a nice throw forward to what's going to what we could maybe look at uh, what's happening next. Um, Aaron, did you want to add something? Um, uh, just just a remark, and I think it's a case uh, called uh, Andrew Pennington. I think he was the guilty person who was finally convicted of almost 30 years uh, rape incident, which occurred in 1988, and he was convicted in 2018. And one of the reasons why they were able to convict him was because they really preserved the evidence, the items from that particular incident. So the police were able to detect a semen stain from the skirt of the victim of that particular assault. So I think what I want to add is that we have to start practicing and um, sort of implementing appropriate ways of preserving evidence, the actual original evidence, not just the DNA samples, but the evidential items, whether it's clothing, whether it's a particular implement found, we must have appropriate and accredited procedures for maintaining the chain of custody of these evidence, even if we are not able to sort of find any relevant evidence in, in, in the present time. I think that was what I wanted to add to that. Thank you. That's an excellent response. And I think that also responds to the question that I specifically got from one uh, journalist in one country asking about what should they do in the you know, event of a uh, high number of, of uh, criminal cases, uh, but where there wasn't DNA technology available right now is that the evidence should be preserved. And we don't know what that could be available for in the future. And one hopes. I'm going to ask um, Ryan and then Catherine if they want to add anything at this stage um in closing and Catherine I did sort of throw forward to you and say what is the future of uh, of human DNA um and but before I get to you and ask Ryan I don't know if you want to say one more remark I know that you'll also be presenting next week as well as well Catherine if you want to say something and then I'm going to hand over to Stephen for closing thank you Nakama. um well next week I'm going to be presenting the Rachel Nickel case um which I think um, everyone can look up but it's a it was a landmark case in Britain um, where a young lady uh, was murdered and they wrongfully convicted someone because the technology of DNA didn't exist at the time, but because they had the, the evidence, they had stored it. Um, years later, after the advent of DNA, they managed to apprehend the, the correct uh, person. And um, one wonders what new technology there'll be, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. So, um, you know, and, I, and I, it's just, such an amazing case that I just think um, needs to be highlighted and we need to consider this case um, for for South Africa, Africa um, and the world and, and the implications of such a case and wrongful conviction and um, and about new technologies that we don't even know exist yet. So this is what I'll be focusing on next week, um, that particular case against the backdrop of um, our country, and uh, we're also going to discuss, for example, you know how to practice good medicine with peanuts, and also how long can you, how long can you store evidence? And there's a whole lot of perspectives about storing evidence because there's infectivity risks, there's space issues. So we we're going there. We're going to ask the tough questions, um, and uh, yeah, come on with your intellect, and we're just going to take it from there. So an honor to be here and thanks thanks for letting me be here thank you thanks so much ryan look forward to seeing you next week and also learning more about ryan's new book which will be coming out soon uh catherine um thanks. i mean thank you. another broad topic what is the future of dna <laughs> so any anything you want to close with as well and then and then Stephen, it'll be over to you as an artist i'm not known for staying in my lane i'm going to try and stay in my lane as much as possible because i'm not a forensic scientist and i cannot predict the future but i can say that just to reiterate what i've heard come up in different ways across all of the esteemed panelists um, inputs today is the business of interdisciplinarity the business of collaboration and that dna is an additional extremely potentially powerful tool in the toolbox for me i work i'm the work of a forensic artist is often seen as like the last chance saloon. So like when you've run out of all of the, the other options, you might, you know, commission a facial image. The only point of doing that is to release it publicly. So I'm starting to rethink the role of the facial image. And that is, it's an incredibly important way. It's an incredibly important science communication tool, because now with some of the experimental work that we're doing, we're including forensic phenotyping, we're including isotopes with the sort of normal standard methods, 
all of that information is ultimately communicated through a relatable, plausible facial image that also restores dignity to the person, the unidentified deceased person whose name we're trying to connect back with their body. And it's, so it's the end of a process, but it's also the beginning potentially of a process, because if that person is recognized, the investigation can continue and then their identity can be confirmed with normal comparative DNA methods and potentially a criminal case can be pursued. The, the perpetrator of if that person was murdered in an investigation to who they might be can, can commence. So I think about myself as being in an odd place, kind of at the end and potentially the beginning of a process. Um, and I'm very much watch this space. I am cautious about, like I said, the claims that that because of the power that DNA holds, especially in the public imagination, and being a media platform, this is important, um, to treat those claims quite carefully when it comes to the idea of faces from DNA. Because the faces from DNA, the way that it's marketed, DNA alone is not producing those faces. But forensic phenotyping is adding to the, the confidence that us as forensic artists can incorporate information into our facial depictions. Thank you very much. That's a really important statement. And I hope uh, one that resonates strongly with the audience. Um, important for us as communicators, as journalists, is to, I think some of the panelists have indeed said, take things with a pinch of salt but also never to, to make claims as strongly as they're often made in press releases, particularly by commercial companies. So there's no one size fits all. I'm going to hand back to Stephen to sort of wrap up and also maybe just uh, um, touch on any other points that you wanted to make um, around the sort of humanitarian efforts. And otherwise, uh, again, look forward to seeing everybody next week at the symposium. And for those who are attending, please watch your inboxes. We will send you a link to the recording of the session and um, as before, if you want to have interviews with any of the panelists or other experts next week, some of them will be available for interviews, please email media at dnaforafrica.com. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nakama, for um, doing such an ex excellent job at moderating. I, I, I would like to make one comment uh, before closing, um, Nakama, and that, that is that, uh, you know, I think we can have the most so sophisticated DNA laboratories. Um, but if we don't have a systems approach, uh, you know, we're, we're always going to fail the victims and we're always going to fail their families and the community. And I say that because in our experience, particularly with missing persons cases, and, and we know the numbers, uh, and Catherine has, sp has spoken to this, there are so many unidentified people. And we're trying to find ways to create greater awareness around the fact that there's literally thousands and thousands of people in this country and in other countries, and Africa is not alone as a continent, where people are just being buried as unidentified year after year. Thousands of bodies are put in common graves. It is a catastrophe. It is a total disaster that is being ignored. We're all passionate about it, but we don't seem to get that acknowledgement, perhaps at the policy level and the government levels of how extraordinary this actual, this, this phenomenon is. Families are often the source of your, of your success, um, whether it's that DNA sample, that biological reference sample. Um, but if there's no national databases, fingerprint databases, um, and there's no DNA databases that can be compared against, it's your family that is ultimately going to be the, the true sort of closing deal um, representative in your identification. And we haven't yet talked about how important families are as partners in this investigative process. Whether it goes to court or not, families are absolutely integral to this entire process. So I'd like to just put that in there because I often see missing persons reports that are not complete and do not consider that this person might be deceased. They're almost right. Police officers need to be trained to understand the forensic relevance of the information they're asking the families. Why is it that the investigators need this information and who's going to use it for what purpose? So we've got a lot to discuss and to unravel um, over that exciting two days. 
I mean, this is an incredible event. I'm so glad to have been part of it. I can't thank um, all the people that signed in, registered and participated. I was taking a quick count at the bottom there and counted up to 158 participants. Um, so I think we are all super proud of that. I counted about 24 different countries being recognized in the chat. I mean, this is this is this is just just shows such uh, a huge commitment from people who genuinely care about forensics and its role in, in our public safety. Um, I think it really also shows off the African participants, the African expertise. Um, Bruce, I know you're American, but you spend most of your life on the African soil. So we adopted you and we're just including you in that. We've got such amazing expertise in Africa and, and you know, people like Vanessa, Bruce, Linda are really pulling these people out of their jobs to showcase what we have across the continent. But we also got the destination to hold these events. We got an event next week in, in one of the most beautiful beautiful cities in the world, Cape Town. So, you know, I'm really happy that this is a pre-symposium event. I'm sure it's given a lot of the participants an opportunity to think about just some of the topics that are going to be discussed, how exciting um, it'll be to hear from a number of these panelists, but others too. Um, we're going to really delve into a lot more material of the of the two over the two days. Um, but but I just yeah, I just wanted to thank the panelists. I want to thank the participants, uh, my co-hosts as well, the University of Advertisement um, School of Journalism in Nahama, DNA for Africa, UNODC. This only happens due to collaboration like that, and we are so happy that you all joined us. So thank you so much. I'll give the last parting word to Vanessa. I see your screens on, but thank you all. See you on. Uh, see you next week in Cape Town, and hopefully we get a lot more people still registering online. We can take more people and help educate them. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks, Stephen. Um, you did mention Nakama, but I think without a great moderator, these sessions just never really go anywhere. So Nakama, thanks to you for holding it together, asking the right questions, um, you know, closing out when, when it's required. And um, just again, as, as Stephen said, the expertise out there, I think we all recognize it. This is just tip of the iceberg that's here today. Um, in terms of moderators, panelists, and even the questions that have been asked yourselves. Um, let's really step into showcasing the expertise we have in Africa. Let's continue this momentum. Um, we have so much to give, we have so much to offer, and so much to show the rest of the world. So on that note, let's keep the light shining, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.